And I'm going to talk um, about Selma Stern herself and then some themes in the book. So um, everyone can see this, right? Yeah, I, I guess so. So I'm going to start by talking about the author, Selma Stern. This is a picture of her we have in our archives at LBI. Um, Selma Stern was born in 1890 in Kippenheim, Germany. She was raised in an upper middle class family. Uh, she was actually the first girl to attend um, her gymnasium, gymnasium in Baden Baden. She graduated from there in 1909. She studied history at the University of Heidelberg and then the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich where she earned her doctorate um, in 1913. And she is actually one of the first women to become a professional historian in Germany. So as if that wasn't enough, <laughs> Selma Stern um, became one of the first female researchers at the newly founded Academy for the Wissenschaft des Judentums in Berlin in 19. 19. So this was an academy for the um, academic study of Judaism. She was one of the first research fellows there and certainly one of the first women. And uh, she began working on a number of uh, projects that centered largely on the period of the court Jews in the, more in the, in the 16, 1700s, um, but sometimes going back into the, almost to the period of the Black Death. And her magnum opus um, was uh, many volume set. Uh, it was just two volumes before she left Germany herself. Um, uh, the Prussian State and the Jews. And it was a study of Jewry in 18th century Prussia and their road to emancipation in, in great detail. And it is still for academics um, of Jewish history, German Jewish history and German history, a very important body of work. So um, it's, it's good to remember Selma Stern was mostly uh, a writer of historical nonfiction, academic scholarly work. She, she was not, a fiction writer. In 1927, Stern married the director of the Academy, historian Eugen Tauber, who was very well known in his own right. Um, he, he was a bit older than her. She was, in, in a sense, his student. Oops, hold on here. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, then we have a this picture from 1938, also from the Leo Beck Institute. This is the library of the, of the, for the Academy. And I'm not sure if Selma Stern is in this picture. She might be somewhere in there, maybe more towards the back. But anyway, this is a room she would have known well. It, it's a, a room in the library of the Institute. And um, Selma Stern is a research historian. She uh, visited many archives and libraries. Uh, once the Nazi rule of Germany began though, of course, she was more and more um, banned from visiting libraries and archives. She uh, still through some personal connections was able to visit some very local ones and some religious ones. But um, by the time that this picture was taken, she was most, she had lost a lot of the resources um, for her work, actually. Uh, this is taken in the spring of 1938, I believe, uh, to, around the graduation of students that year from the academy. And of course, in the fall of 1938, came the Kristallnacht and uh, hold on here, have them there. This is um, a painting of the court Jew for the Prussian emperor Daniel Itzig and people who attend the book club remember last month's choice. She, um, this man is actually the father of Fanny von Arnstein. I mentioned her work, um, the Prussian state and the Jews 
a lot of it uh, was about, in particular, Daniel Itzig, but about many, many, many other people besides. I put this slide in the shonen just as a reminder to talk about the kind of work um, that Fanny was doing, or that, sorry, that Selma was doing. In addition, um, Selma was very hopeful about uh, Germans, about Jews in Germany and the emancipation. And she um, really saw herself as documenting this journey to emancipation and into a better world, so to say. And she um, believed that uh, there was a new cult, a new society beginning where Jews and Germans would live together um, in greater harmony. Um, as brothers, let us say, um, fo uh, following the First World War, especially and through the 1920s. So um, for her, um, and, and personal letters and stuff show this, it was a great uh, disapp disappointment and, and sadness um, what the Nazi period uh, suddenly brought to Germany and to the Jews. This is uh, an image of the, from the Kristallnacht. After the Kristallnacht, people were leaving. Everyone who could was leaving Germany, who, who, if you were Jewish. And they had actually tried leaving earlier and tried to reestablish the Academy for the Study of the Jews, moving it from Berlin to London. But this hadn't worked out, and they had come back to, back to Germany. And they stayed in Germany actually until March of 1941, so quite late. Uh, and then they were able to get out of the country at that point, so really some of the last. And um, they managed to get to the United States and thanks to a, an aid program for German Jewish academics. Um, they both found a new home in Cincinnati at the Hebrew Union College, uh, where she actually was a contributor to establishing the American Jewish archives. And she performed her own research at the same time still, but in a sense, only on the side. Uh, her husband died after the war in 1953. And at that, um, and it was after that, that Selma decided to move back to Europe to live with her sister in Switzerland. And um, she, when she got back to Switzerland, she also decided to write about um, the history of Joselle of Rosenheim, who was a, uh, uh, a famous um, figure of the court Jews in the 1500s at the time of the Reformation. And he had actively done a lot to protect Jewish communities in Germany from persecution in that time period. Uh, she had to say about returning to Southern Germany and Vienna where she found herself visiting archives that she hadn't seen in a long time. Uh, she said that, quote, seeing the old fatherland again was something that got me really worked up, <laughs> if one can imagine. Um, she originally intended to write about um, Josel in English for the benefit of a more American audience. But when the Leo Beck Institute was established, she decided to release it in German first. And in fact, Stern was uh, one of the founders of the Leo Beck Institute. Uh, we know Stern was very excited about um, publishing uh, her work in German. She wrote a friend that she suffered from stage fright and missed the counsel and feedback of her late husband, Tobler, who had died, as I said, in 1953. Uh, she went back, had the book published in German and lived in Switzerland, but she never lived again in, Germ in, in Germany. And um, according to some documentation, that was just too uncomfortable for her to go back there. But she did live close and she did visit. Now, one interesting thing um, about Selma Stern's book, to go away from um, 
the little biography I presented. This is her book, Josella of Rosheim, which was published in 65, is to talk about this book, The Spirit Returneth in Light of um, the Holocaust. Um, reviewers at the time were quick to mention that this book published a year after the Holocaust had happened in 1946 was uh, really Selma Stern's attempt, and like I said, they said this even at the time, to, um, to deal with the Holocaust and what had happened in Europe, but doing it by telling the story of an earlier time and another persecution, pogroms, mass murder of the Jewish people. At the top, we have a scene from the Nuremberg Chronicles written in 1493, uh, the burning of Jews, presumably at the time of the Black Death, which had been 150 years before. The picture at the bottom is, is, is an image from Auschwitz, uh, the death camp today. And I'm gonna quickly talk about some things I found, which, we, uh, which I'm happy to debate about, uh, that do connect the, um, the time period and story in the spirit return to the Holocaust. This is a painting on Black Forest Furs by Hans Thoma. I thought it would, it was a good, a good example for what I was going to discuss. So, you know, there's this idea of the German forest and the German woods and the German people themselves as Teutonic barbarian type people. And I, I thought it was really interesting that it, towards the beginning of the novel, um, there is a, um, a Count Ruprecht of the Palatinate, I believe, and this is in Heidelberg. And um, one thing he says there, which stuck out for me, is as a German ruler himself, he starts talking about how, how the German people are from the woods and the forest. And in a sense, they come from this barbarian background. And uh, once there, it's like a cycle where, where it can't be helped, but they revert to this barbarianism. And then these terrible things happen, particularly to uh, the Jewish people. And that's a very interesting scene in the novel because at the end of that novel, he's warned um, uh, this, this Jewish count, count a, a court Jew, his court Jew, to flee with his family to the Polish lands. Uh, and then as he says that, to send his friend to safety, he walks off with his dogs whistling. And of course he walks off into the woods <laughs> as a German himself. So I, I thought that was very interesting. Also in the novel, there are a lot of um, images of the dark and uh, empty woods and people don't like the forest. The Jew, um, the one daughter uh, who is married and living in uh, Heidelberg, she likes living along the river with the uh, culture and the lights from the boats and so on. So there's, to me, there was this um, comparison between the dark wooded forests and then the civilized cities. And I, I think later uh, in the book, we see the danger coming often out of the forest, out of the wilderness and attacking the city. So that, that was just a kind of interesting topic, I thought that maybe we, we could talk about. And I think after the war, um, it, th this was a common trope, and I think it started before the Holocaust, or maybe even with really with World War I or before, uh, the Hun, the German, the, the fighter, the barbarian, and they regress back to this primitive state and commit all these crimes and try and take over the world and so on. Uh, almost a kind of transcendent way of, of maybe explaining the Holocaust and why the Holocaust happened in some ways, because it's just this German uh, characteristic as a people. Um, to turn to Nazi propaganda, uh, of course, in the book, The Spirit Returneth, the, 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 there's, a, there's clearly the fact that Jews play the role of wealthy bankers, of money lenders, and oftentimes the non-Jewish Christians around them owe them a lot of money. 
And in a sense, of course, this was very much a Nazi argument too, that non-Jews uh, were financially oppressed by the Jews. And also, I mean, Jews in Germany and Austria were largely middle and upper middle class people as, as a whole. So uh, they, they, they were seen uh, by many um, in an anti-Semitic way as uh, opportunists and, and financially oppressing the poor and so on, much like in this, in this novel. Of course, there's, that's just one of many medieval anti-Semitic tropes that come up in this novel, but they also came up again in the Nazi period. Right, this is a very good example of a Der Stürmer, the anti-Semitic Nazi newspaper. This is an article from August 34 about the um, blood libel, I believe it's from August 34, where Jews kill innocent Christian children, and they use their blood in rituals or to make matzo or so on. This is a long-standing accusation, anti-Semitic accusation against Jews um, in Europe. It comes up in the spirit returneth and it comes up, it even still comes up today. Certainly all these still come up today. Now um, to turn to the Jewish side of things, uh, we can compare stories of survival and resistance in the spirit returneth with um, what happened in the Holocaust. People survive in different ways. Some managed to flee the novel, the, part of the family flees to safety in Poland. Accepting death as a martyr, I think is an interesting thing to point out. And of course is all over the book, The Spirit Returneth. And we can talk about that because, um, uh, you know, it's, it's even in, in the historical records, I mean, it, it's uncertain how, how true that was always the case, of course. But I think um, in the Holocaust, uh, well, we'll get, we'll get down to it here. There's also literally escaping mass murder, fleeing while it's happening and escaping. Suicide, um, perhaps as a method of not survival, but of resistance and surviving with, with, with perhaps some dignity. Dying with dignity. I, to me, that goes into accepting death as a martyr in, in this novel. Um, I think that uh, after the war, and I, I think in many texts, uh, there is a there is a motif where the Jews being murdered in the Holocaust uh, die um, die proudly as Jews. They don't um, become just animals. I think I think a, a very good example of this would be in the TV series Holocaust that was so popular. Um, it kind of opened the door to talking about the Holocaust again, really all over the world, perhaps, when it came out in 1978. And the main character, the main, one of the main female characters, a kind of matriarch of the family, who, of course, is, a, you know, a piano player and her father served in the First World War. And she's very cultured and sophisticated when she is going to be murdered in Auschwitz in the gas chamber, she's talking to this younger girl with her, you know, to, um, you know, to uh, keep calm, to follow orders, to accept things gracefully, what's about to happen to them. And then at the end, I think that's a very good example of this kind of, what became a real, a real um, motif in Holocaust literature. There's physical resistance. A Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And we can talk about that. I, I, it's hard. I believe that that was in Selma Stern's mind, probably. Myself, personally, I believe that. I have not read that. Hiding with the aid of non-Jews, this happens at the end of the novel, where a child survives and then is returned to the family. And life is now going to continue, a new world. But the Jews are also going to continue. 